Cool, so doing a presentation on anxiety and coping strategies. So first we're going to go to... What is anxiety? I said anxiety is the feeling of nervousness associated with um, doing an activity. So it could be a goal that you've set and you're, you might not achieve that goal because you're thinking of an outside um, element that can be brought in. And that nervousness is going to cause some uh, symptoms that can be seen and felt by you. So symptoms include nausea, tense, fast breathing, lightheaded, sweating, and trouble sleeping. So nausea is the, the sickness that you feel before you, you get to a, a challenge. The, the pit in your stomach just feels like it's churning. Tense is the uh, freezing, the clenching of muscles on attention. Fast breathing and the uh, fast pace of conversation is something that can be picked up by other people. So you feel uh, nervous, so you just fill the silence with words. Uh, lightheading comes from a fast breathing. So you can start to hyperventilate and you start to get into shock effectively. That's where sweating comes in as well. Now you can imagine in a, a sporting environment, say a shot put he's he stood up to his circle, he's picked up his, his big ball and he starts sweating. And as he spins, he starts slipping out. So he needs to be able to control anxiety. So where does anxiety turn, uh, where does anxiety come to play? So the inverted youth theory says that Performance and arousal uh, affect each other. So, so this is the inverted U theory. So, as arousal increases, performance increases. Now, this changes depending on um, what sport you do. So, for a sport such as shot putting, you'll need to be able to focus, but you also need that arousal to kick in. So, you've got the power, the oomph to get in. So if you're under aroused, you'd be in this area and you won't be able to get any power in and you'll be feeling, oh no, what have, I, what have I done wrong? Why is everyone quiet? Why is everyone, um, why is everyone not talking? Why is everyone uh, looking at me weird? And if you're over out, but oh, I can do this and do this, I'm, I'm amazing. I'll get right through this, no problems. So you need to be in this top area. This is the optimal performance zone. Um, so this is where you're just amped enough to be able to perform or clear head so you can um, think about what you're doing. Alright, so the, uh, this U theory changes depending on who it's uh, applied to. So a chess tournament, because you put that top link there, a chess tournament will need a low level arousal so it can keep your head clearer and uh, be able to perform mental tasks quickly. So a chess environment will be very different from a weightlifting environment. So the environment that chess is in will be dead quiet. There'll be just two people sat there with a clock next to them. So what they do is they make their move hit the clock, and that's when the time starts for the next person. So if they make their move hit the clock and stand there and watch the clock, they're going to gain anxiety by while my time's running out, I need, to, I need to do something. And that will decrease their performance in chess because they won't be thinking of making their moves, they'll be thinking of the time and the clock. That's when, if you remember the youth the theory, that's when they'll be in there over uh, aroused. So in this video, you just get 10 seconds in. Okay, so as you can hear, it's just the background noise. So it's a bit loud because they're in a big hall. So it's just the background noise going up and everything else is dead quiet. So it's dead silence between two competitors and all the spectators. And this is the clock that I was talking about. Now you notice neither one of them is looking anywhere near the clock because they know if they look at that clock, they get nervous and make mistakes. Alright? So this guy just now, he's got to just wait a minute. And he'll just he'll stop and he'll look off into the distance. He won't look at the clock, he won't look at the board, he'll just look off and just focus in again. That's when he's bringing himself down and around so he can then focus in. Cool, just let jump. Cool. Now, a very different environment is weightlifting. So we can play this one. Uh, weightlifting is a loud environment, very boisterous. So they have the initial power, 
They're not trying to do something very complicated that we're playing right this one. They're not trying to do anything complicated. They're trying to get up, get to their platform, fall, and leave. So as you can hear, crowd's going. And when he does his lift, they're not quiet. All right? They shout, they scream. So I'm just a uh, few seconds. Just there, you heard all the coaches kick in, like, go on, you can do it, go on. That's increasing his arousal, to increase his performance of doing that lift. And everything in the background now is again, trying to increase his arousal on Cool, so, how does it affect performance? So, as I said in the inverted view, an athlete may experience high levels of anxiety that can affect the tax execution and performance. So back to the chess, if he's uh, really anxious and really aroused, he can go, oh no, I've made that mistake, what am I going to do next? And he's then not thinking about what he should have done instead. He's then thinking about his mistake and then loses contrast. The other side of that is the weightlifting. If he's under aroused and he can't, he gets there, he's thinking about a million different things. And he goes, Whoa, oh, I need to do this, 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 and this. And in fact, he just needs to perform. He's done it a million times, he just needs to do it again. And uh, this type of thing, if he, if the weightlifter did mess that up, so he went for his second attempt again, he didn't show you, we went for his second attempt, we made it. Well, if he made it, if he failed that second attempt again, he could develop stress, like post-traumatic stress from that. So, to deal with anxiety. So meditation is a great way to deal with anxiety. Can you take a seat? Cool. Are you nervous about your presentation, Chris? No. No, not at all. No. All right, cool. So what I've done there is just increased Chris's morale, so he's a bit nervous. So we're going to do some meditation. So Chris, just close your eyes and take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold it for five seconds. Exhale through your mouth. Okay, so what Chris is feeling now, which would be normal, I'll tell you. What Chris will be feeling now is his whole body will start to relax. Okay, because he's brought himself back to center. So he knows what he's doing, he knows how to do it, and he's because of his hold too. And he, he'll just keep doing that, and slowly his arousal will decrease, and he'll be back to his state where he wouldn't nervous. Thanks, Chris. So, meditation is a great tool, and it can be trained, it can be. Uh, Trained in effectiveness and time. So just there, Chris stood there for what, five seconds of that? Yeah? So it was a five seconds, it was a quick hit. So it can be trained. So if you, instead of sitting down there for hours and end, hours and end, bringing your arousal down, you can just mainly cue yourself in to say, oh, if I do this, I can bring myself down, and then I'll be fine. Okay? So meditation can be used as well. Okay, physical relaxation, PMR, progressive muscle relaxation. Is a great one for games that need that physical element. So volleyball is a great one because you can abbreviate PMR. So instead of um, so PMR basically is you start on your feet and just tense things for five seconds, let it go, tense five seconds, let it go, and move your weight with your body until your whole body's relaxed. So you can abbreviate PMR. So a volleyball player before they serve, take a couple of seconds, tense their hand, and then serve. So that abbreviation can also have an incredible effect. Okay. So the effect has been trained in because they've done it before in previous games, they've done it before and they know what they're doing. So it's been trained in and they're conditioned, so when they step up to the plate, tense, relax, and then serve, they know what they're doing, you know how to do it, and their arousal's decreased. Okay? So if you did muscle uh, relaxation and you were too lax threw the ball up and hit it, and it just hit the net. You go, oh no, got it. So you need a way to amp yourself back up as well. So that's what the coach and that's what your team would be there for. So uh, physical relaxation is more of a personal thing, so it will only relax you. So you have to kind of like take control from yourself. So I was going to cover physical I'm going to go motivation uh, on the flip side of anxiety, really. You've got to be able to carry on with it. Uh, volleyball around you, you've got to be able to pick yourself back up once you've got to that. Uh, if you do, say if you call the net, 
Hey, you've got to be able to take yourself back up, but it's, it's over a different period of time. You can have long term, short term, so we look at all that. So, uh, this guy Sage said the motivation is the direction and intensity of efforts. So just whatever you're putting in to whatever you're doing, um, you're going to try and get back out, it's going to keep you there. Um, um, oh yeah, what the, looking at different people, uh, what motivates them, what makes them decide to have a go at something or someone take it to a professional level and devote their life to it, that whatever motivates them, it's different from person to person. Now there's two sides to it, there's going to be a physical reaction to being motivated, uh, your body's going to react, it's going to get your adrenaline high, you're going to be sharp, your reactions will be quicker, heart rate goes up, uh, respiration goes up, everything's just sharp and just ready to see it, ready to perform whenever it comes around. And then you've got the cognitive side of it. So keeping your brain just active, um, using to psych yourself up, but that's only a short term thing. You've got to be able to do it over long term as well. Um, say if you were doing a training schedule, um, it's going to be over months at a time and you need to be able to just remember why you're doing it in the first place. And keep yourself at that level of motivation so it's dips off, it's very hard to just drag yourself out of bed and keep obviously training for something that's mile in the distance but the you can self up one is a short term thing just so you can do it just before you perform that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, on the flip side of it though it can be detrimental if you've uh, on the cognitive side of it if you've overdone it, over psyched yourself up uh, like powerlifters, for example, do, do obviously you've got to be at that level of you've got to be you know highly aroused to do it. But if you overdo it, you're gonna too much going on. You're too switched on. You can't. You've got, you've got to be able to relax to a certain extent with it as well. Um, it's gonna have negative effects on your attitude. You become too critical, and um, by just overthinking it, oh that was only we look at self talk in a minute. But you're gonna start having a word at yourself, taking yourself down a bit, and that's what you're gonna be doing. Um, on the Flip side, again, you've got the body's physical reaction to, be to being too overly motivated, your adrenaline's too high, you begin to tense up, you'll freeze, you become rigid, you're never going to get out of it what you need to if you're an athlete in particular, you're not going to be able to perform at the level you need to be. Cool, so motivation can come from two sources. <clears throat> We've got extrinsic, which is going to be looking at um, all the things that uh, outside of your control, so you've got, if you're performing in competitions, money, rewards, contracts, sponsorship deals, everything possible that you want to try and get out of that, or promotion of work, not just athletes, if you have more money, more power, anything like that that's going to motivate you other than what drives you to do it. It's more um, relevant in uh, non-vocational uh, jobs, where people are just there, just, just for the money, office jobs, I mean, no one wants to really grow up and do an office job, but if they are there, they're because it's all things extra that motivate them. So it's um, all material possessions really that are keeping them going. Uh, and they do nothing towards kind of, they, I mean, they develop you as a person, but emotional development is not much there. Um, but on extrinsic side of it, um, you're looking at why you're doing it in the first place, just like outdoor ed in particular, you picked it because it's what you enjoy. You're not going to potentially make a lot of money out of it, but it's not what you did it for in the first place. It's you, know, you, you enjoy being out to keep you keep you sane. I go and say you work in the shop all the time. I actually hate it, but just it, it's fulfilling that just desire in the first place that you had. Um, it was just born. You were just born with it. It's just intrinsic. It's just within you that you just you get something out of it, and that's what motivates you to do it. Um, I can't remember what's on this page. Now this one, students are a great example. So again, we're a vocational course, uh, what it boils down to really. Um, and it's one of the most you to come in in the mornings, basically. If you've got something like sort of <coughs> business management, accountant, it's all very kind of high frequency above the shoulders. You're there because you want to, you kind of make money, you want to do six, you want to be successful, you want to do something in that field. But um, that is very much extrinsically motivated that they're because they want kind of more material possessions to improve the quality of life, that kind of thing. But if, you, if they're there just for the grades, using the university example, if they're just for the grades that do really well, that's what motivates them. But if you're looking at doing something like, we are, again, you're here for the grades, but you're here for a different reason, possibly. I mean, I don't know what it works with you guys, but for me, it's more just kind of, I enjoy the subject, you're, you're there because you enjoy what you do, 
and you, you, what you'll get out of it on an emotional level more than what you'll get out of it kind of material-wise at the end of it. Right, so there's a couple of theories need to achieve. Um, is one, it looks at basically just this desire to kind of, you, you're not, you, you just, you want it, sorry, uh, you don't want, <coughs> you don't want to fail. Um, you make a decision based on what you're going to get out of it. So personal traits and everything come into it, but you stand to gain more um, from obviously succeeding in what you're doing. So people are more focused on winning uh, failures, such a, it's a foreign concept, they don't want to think about it, they've got to think about winning all the time and just to go that extra mile to get the obviously monetary rewards. Um, the whole like little value, it's more to do with um, just getting there in the first place. People over with this kind of uh, this theory looks at people who are happy just to have a go and push the limits to say if you've never climbed before. If you this if you're in this kind of mindset you climb way above your brain and if you fail, so it looks you have a go, but you get other people who are happy just having a go um, and they might not aim for kind of the, the highest they can do, they won't push themselves necessarily, but they at least they know they're not going to fail. They're, they're, they're not worried about failing, that they just rather play it safe and do a lower grade to keep themselves obviously. People are just, people are happy doing that, I'm one, I'm not going to go mental and push myself as hard as I can when I know I'm perfectly happy doing a lower grade and I know I'll get the top and all that, you're happier doing it, you get a better kick out of it. Um, but that's it's, it's more of an emotional level. That one gives you just uh, the boost that rather than you're aiming for the start, you just get happy, just just perform at a level you know you can perform at. Um, there's a couple of coping strategies uh, for motivation, just to kind of build that motivation, and they've got to be able to get there in order to perform, just to just to psych themselves up again. But it's not just the psyching up; it's more to do it. Um, the hurry uh, so it's uh, just to maintain that motivation as well through what you're doing. Uh, so self-talk. Now it's a it's a it's a, this an ongoing dialogue. Everyone has it. Just talking about what's what you're going through. What just any little thought. You don't necessarily have to vocalise it, but just just say it in your head. It's just a way you kind of put what you're thinking into words and the way you can understand it. Um, but everyone does it on a daily basis. There's something like sixty thousand thoughts we have a day, and seventy percent of them are negative. So it's just about kind of. Self talks about making them more, um, not necessarily making them positive, but just changing how they affect you. So, yeah, you can still have those negative thoughts, but if you just, okay, I'll have it, move on, rather than dwell on it, and it'll affect you. Um, it's, yeah, it's another way of just the brain kind of rationalising what's going on. You're weighing up those pros and cons. Oh, should I have that for tea? Oh, I had that last night. It's just that little thing in your head, it might not be anything significant. It's not going to have an effect on your day, but. Tiny little things, we do it all the time. Uh, now, there's, it does fall into three categories. So you've got positive, which is standing there and going, right, I can do this, I know I can do it, I've got to be able to perform in a second, I've done it before, you know, the little short, sharp kind of things. There's no point in having a full on conversation with yourself because you're just rabbit in. So, little um, cue words, just to, yeah, don't give up, I can do this, just little things that either people can shout at you or you can say to yourself in your own head. You've got instructional, which I do um, all the time when I'm kind of, just before you're doing it, you're talking yourself through it, even though you know exactly what to do. You know what you're doing. I'll say, I'll say I'm setting up a, um, and I get the top of the climb, I'm still going around, I need to do this, got this, do this, and I'll be sitting there mumbling to myself, but you're just going through that checklist in your own head, more for just peace of mind, and proving to yourself that you know what you're doing, rather than trying to prove to someone else if they, you know, if they're in on it as well, that's fine. Uh, and then negative, completely counterproductive. You don't want to be doing this. It's again, you can have those negative thoughts. You've got to try and adjust your habits so that you you have them less of them, but you can still have them. But just don't dwell on them. It's a way of kind of venting frustration. Just if you you know, perform lawfully, you're gonna have a go at yourself. You're gonna work yourself, but it's how the uh, the effect you, uh, and how it's gonna manifest itself through negative thoughts. Um, and it's it's gonna be it's gonna affect your performance and being that critical. Go with yourself is no, it's no good. All right, so that's self talk goal setting. Now this is going to break down into goal setting. Basically, is just looking at what you've got to achieve, um, and then how are you going to get there? All the stepping stones along the way. So you've got your end goal. I've done this in the wrong order, really. But you've got. Would you go? Would you go? Would you go backwards? Go go forward two for me. Yeah. 
all right, so you've got your long-term goal. This is the main thing that you are aiming towards. There might only be one, there might be one or two, just I'm looking to perform in whatever, in six months. I'm looking to lose this much weight, I'm looking to have this much money. Whatever it is, that's your main final goal. Um, all the little steps before it are how you're going to get there. Uh, this does, um, it's going to be a combination of all the short-term goals and all the intermediate goals. It breaks down into three, you've got long, intermediate and short. But um, by sticking to all the others, that's how you're going to get there in the end. Uh, would you go with it? Uh, yeah, sorry. There has to be a progression in short-term goals. If they're all dead simple, you're not challenging yourself. Um, if, if, you, if you know you can actually blast them and you just put them down for the sake of it, it might give you a bit of a motivation boost to see that many checks off your tick list, but there's no real kind of gain to it. You're not pushing yourself, you're not improving. And when that end goal is rolled around, you've not really moved on from where you were six months ago. On paper, you have, but physically or you know, mentally, you've not really progressed, you've not grown as a person to get to that, to prepare yourself for that end goal, be able to go back home for me. Goals are intermediate goals. It's a bit in between, so you might have five of these for, you know, if you've got one long term, you've got five intermediate ones. <clears throat> um, and these break down again into short term goals, but um, it, these, these are the kind of main milestones. So if it's a year training program, you might have one of these every three months. And um, it's just a way of gauging, kind of keeping you on track. Um, it used to improve athletes, sorry, yeah, over, over a year, example, these would be the months in between, and then obviously short term goals in between each other day. Did you go back again? Nice one. So these emphasize the very specific phases of uh, we'll keep the athlete analogy training. So you've got, you know, you need to get up tomorrow and do this, you know, little kind of day to day basic tasks, just breaking them down. They might not be that specific as day to day, but just working towards the little ones that are going to make up the bigger picture. Uh, they need to be um, smart, I've not mentioned that one this morning. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, they need to be smart, they need to be goal orientated in a way that you're going to be able to uh, use them. You can sit there and plan all the goals you need, but if they're not, hey, I'll talk through that now, but if, you're not, if they're not proper kind of goals, you're not going to get anywhere. Else. So they've got to be uh, specific as to what you want them to be for. Um, training for you know, something else and then having a uh, unspecific goal, like got to get up at whatever time or uh, got, to, got to train or whatever, it's, it's not, you've got to be specific training to what you need it to be for, so you're not going to do weights for necessarily a uh, balance and match or whatever, you know, so it's got to be for what it's there for, uh, measurable, you've got to be able to quantify what you've got, uh, what, how far along you are, did, you know, did, I, you know, did I achieve what I set out to do in that goal, in that session, um, you've got to be able to just Quantitate what you quantitate, quantify what you've got, um, and have you achieved it? Yes or no? Uh, achievable? Is it uh, something that it, it's going to be? Um, is it something you're going to be able to do? Uh, if it's not, then you, you're going to set yourself to fail. If it's um, if it's, it's something that's too hard outside your comfort zone or anything like that, you're not going to really get anywhere with it. And it's just going to demotivate you ultimately if you come around to do it and you end up failing. Realistic, it's got to, I mean, you can have a time scale, but that's what it's used for. But if it's, you know, go to the Olympics in six months, it's not going to really happen. You've got to be, you know, people to realize this kind of thing. So you've got to make sure, I mean, that can be your end goal, but you've got to get all the little realistic ones along the way. You've got to realistically just kind of put into whatever you're going to get out is what you're going to put in, but you've got to kind of be sensible about what you're going to spend your time on. And the tiers for time, uh, again, the six month scales are going to be nothing if you're going to train to go to the Olympics. You've got to kind of put the time in, but it's got to be a decent time scale. And then when you get to the end of all your, your, your goal plan, if you've not achieved it, you've got to look at just kind of why, reflect on it, review, and you, you can, that's the thing, they're not too rigid, they're not too flexible. It's, it's to do with, um, sorry, yeah, it, it's got to be, if someone puts this in place for you, or if you know about it, but you can't just go making these plans, you've got to have some knowledge behind it to be able to kind of make a decent plan that's going to give you what you need. Um, that is just about done. Thank you. Yeah.
Excellent, well done.